Hello everybody, this is Mariana, your Eatwin Edu moderator and I'm very happy to welcome you all for our sixth uh, ex into, uh, inclusive education webinar or expert talk, this time with an expert from Canada, Mr. Joe Schick, uh, and I hope I have pronounced the surname correctly. Um, Joe is the principal of University Heights Public School. Uh, Thames Valley Public School in London, which is not in Britain, it actually is in Ontario, Canada. He has worked in education for 25 years and during his career he has taught at the university, high school, junior high school and elementary school. So we have somebody who has worked in all of the areas. He is a consultant for, was a consultant for curriculum and professor at Teachers College where he taught students before their employment as a teacher. He's a trained local historian and has published numerous books, including his Active Citizens Today, a global citizen citizenship for local schools handbook. Uh, during his career, he was nominated for numerous awards in the field of education, including the Governor's General Award of Canada for the teaching of history and the award of International Society for Technology and Education, also known for as ISTE, for educational staff in the area of online education. He is, uh, was a member of numerous committees, including the Committee of New Administrator and the Committee for Social Justice uh, through the school board. And uh, what I have known of Joe is that he has been included in time project for 20 years and in this capacity he has led workshops, workshops, lectures in Greece, France, the Netherlands and Croatia where I had finally met him last year. He has presented numerous times online over the past 21 years on virtually every continent as he would say and is thrilled to be once again to be working with an international audience. So I think we are all very happy and eager to listen to you. I'm uh, going to mute myself and thank you one more time for joining us and for coming and thank you all for uh, coming uh, to lis listen what Joe is going to, uh, pr uh, to tell us about. Okay, Joe, the mic is yours. Well, thank you and first and foremost, thank you so much, Mariana, for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm excited, as, a, as it says in the introduction. Uh, I'm eager to start and eager to chat with you today about technology, uh, projects, and inclusion in education. Uh, but of course, in any situation, and Mariana, we're going to make our first change right now to a video. Um, the, the greatest way to start is with a good hello. There we go. Alt so what you're seeing are two students in different countries and they're amazed by the reaction I'm amazed by the reaction that a simple hello can get So I'm every time when you say hello to someone in their native language, how it evokes the same. Didn't matter whether it was Indonesian, Croatian, or Dutch, the reaction from the students was the same. So hello everyone in your native language and welcome. I want to thank eTweening for having me. Uh, eTweening Europe, we've had a long-standing connection with the Time Project, so I'm eager to bring more members of the European Union into the fold with our time project. Uh, in this session today, you're going to hopefully be convinced of the role that technology is going to play within an inclusionary classroom. And I'm going to make a case, hopefully, for that with you this, uh, this evening. 
um, I want you to understand that when you take this away, you're going to be choosing to explicitly teach technology. Not hand it out, but teach it, and that will lead to active student choice and usage. And finally, when you have that in place, I'm hopefully also going to make an argument for you today, a case for you today, that you're going to seek inquiry-based projects like Time Project, and that's going to allow you for a smooth inclusionary model. It's not so much just to make a case for you, but I also want to give you the how. Because quite often, when we look at inclusionary classrooms, we say to ourselves, well, I'm facing a room with a variety of learners in front of me, many levels. I'm looking at a variety of access points to education in front of me. I'm looking at a variety of learning challenges and difficulties in front of me. And when I look at the technology, it's a vast and varied resource as well. And there's just one of me. And so I do understand and I do, I, I do feel that situation. Is how do I build an inclusionary classroom when I have all of that in front of me? And I'm going to argue that inclusive technology is the key. So inclusion, if we break the word down, inclusion should contain elements of concept mastery, collaboration, inquiry, and engagement at the level of the student, reaching them where they're at. Technology can be the vehicle for all students to access the learning at their level and at their rate of comprehension. It also, technology holds that interest hook for students. The technology allows them to not only vary the inquiry, but allows them to vary the output and it allows them to facilitate the learning as we go along. So technology can be a very powerful ally when used correctly in an inclusion-based classroom. And then finally, inclusive technology should be a combination of both those two terms together. And that's what I mean by inclusive technology. What do we do with this? Well, I want you to look back and think to yourself, who remembers this kind of technology? And some of it's very old, so I'm asking you to think about that for just a moment. Who can remember those things? Because when we say technology, we could mean a variety of things, after all. The technology in your classroom. I want you to think about five pieces of technology that you use at one time, maybe just five years ago, ten years ago. Chalk, VHS, overhead, interactive whiteboards, a DVD player, a computer. Now, which pieces of technology that you had then, you still have now, which ones create an inclusive learning environment? Which ones do you go to to allow for all types of learners in your classroom? I want you to just think about that for a moment. And I know we're not in a, in a, in a discussion. What Maybe through the chat, you can post your ideas there. Which items do you use to create an inclusive environment? I still have a DVD player and a VCR. Yep. See, what I'm going to get at, as, and as these come up, BYOD, exactly. What I'm going to get at is that some of the technology that we use, we use to create lessons, so handouts and such. Some of the technology we use to deliver lessons, like a PowerPoint slide, Prezi, so forth. But which pieces of technology are we actively using where the students use the technology, first off, and they select the technology they need for the task at hand? And that, my friends, is the key. It's not enough for us to use the technology, whether it be tablets, whether it be whiteboards, it's about using that technology for the students. It's about teaching the technology explicitly up front and then allowing the students to select them the same way as they would select manipulatives for a math activity. Which, act, which manipulative, which technology will help them with the task at hand? And that begs the question, which tasks at hand do we have? When we think about technology over the last few years, and this slide, is just the scratch of the surface. Just the scratch. Have a quick look at that slide. You'll see certain things in there that you'll identify very easily. Look where the Blu-ray player sits now on that timeline. And think about that at one time being very current technology. Look into the future as we go beyond, both in web-based, software, hardware. 
my slide is almost out of date even as I'm using it. Look at the semantic web exists. Look at web-based storage, very common now. You pay a fair bit of money for that. That's where we're at. And you might say to yourself, oh my goodness, with that much technology, how am I going to select that to create that collaborative piece, that engaging piece, that inquiry-based piece? Let's go to the next step. Who has one of these? Do we have BYOD, bring your own device in our classroom? And if so, how are we using that technology that's being brought in that we don't have to buy, that we don't have to have a, a line for? And I'm asking these questions to really get you thinking about where you're at today with technology in your classroom and how it's used. That's the key. If we think of our cell phones in the classroom, we can't help but think about this. This gets translated. It's a universal language. Look at the social media. Look at all the ways we connect. Look at all the ways that we have platforms for student use. If you think about that and you think about your classroom, how often do you create Facebook posts in your classroom? How often do you have your students compose a tweet? How often do you ask them to gather media in such a way that they can post it on Tumblr or another blog site? How many blog on a regular basis? All these types of media, mixed media, still require composition skills and writing skills in native language. They still require the use of proper grammar and syntax and structure. They all still require students to engage in a reading writing process just in a different medium. But I would put it to you that in, for an inclusionary classroom these provide powerful tools of both engagement and real-world application that allow you to vary and differentiate the instruction both the input and the output. Now I want to ask you with a virtual hand I want you to raise your one hand if you had a cell phone or a tablet or one of those devices. Raise your virtual hand. Now, raise your other hand if you have at least one of those items on my screen. I have eight. Now, I'd like to, you to use technology with your hands like this, and I want you to write your name. If we don't have technology in the classroom today, I would argue that you are disabling your own students that you are cutting them off from something as simple as writing their name. My argument will be that if you do not have a BYOD policy, if you are not actively using the technology available and having the students use the technology in this kind of way, you have limited and you have restricted them in a, in a way that cuts them off from you, that in a way separates them from you, in a way that says, the classroom is not the place to be, not to, the place to live, because their lives revolve around connectivity. To illustrate my point, I have another short video for you. If we can switch the slides again and go back to a sharing, thank you. Here. Just bear with me. It, it shut off there for me. No problem. There it is. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Go ahead and have a seat. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for having us. We are a marketing research company, so I need to collect your phone so you can't take pictures, can Instagram, can't tweet about things. Thank you. Go ahead and put your safety goggles on at this time. <laughs>
Terrifying how many things are connected to my phone. I don't want to punch you in the face. How does it feel to not be connected? Uh, my chest hurts. Broke. I feel like I'm in a pioneer days or something. Why do you think that is? Because you're so connected with it. Like, I have to have it on me at all times. Well. All right, we can go back to the slides. So, think for a moment what you just heard. Pioneer day. Broken. Not connected. They want to punch the teacher in the face. You don't want that situation with your students. You don't want to send that message that there's your life and then there's what we do in the classroom and that's very different. And in an inclusion based classroom where students are in the classroom and they have challenges they come with struggles in their own learning and you want to include them in the whole class model, we limit them even further by denying them access to that, that technology. We put their hands up and leave them unable to perform the simplest tasks. So my goal here is, is to raise your awareness of the need for this technology, but I'm also aware of the vastness of it. I showed you that earlier slide of that long timeline, and that's just really scratching the surface. So the question becomes, the real question becomes, how do we make this modern classroom work? What's really involved? Well, the modern classroom, from my perspective, is that students are taught to use the technology in that inclusion learning environment. They find a piece of technology, whether it be an app, software, or a piece of hardware that assists them in overcoming whatever deficits they might have and uh, help them celebrate their strengths. And then they're taught explicitly by you to use that technology or by the people who come in and assist you with that to use that technology and make choices for the right moment. Now from your perspective it's also about the learning environment. If you want to create an open-ended learning environment this will allow your students to explore at their rate of speed with the technology you've given. That speaks to programming. Well, as part of that programming, it needs to be authentic, real world, and it should connect to the student's interests. This sounds daunting and challenging, but the reality is there are a number of opportunities out there for you, already designed, already in place. All you need to do is reach out and embrace them, bring them into your classroom, and implement them. And that way, you can match this, this modern classroom criteria. If the technology and the curriculum connect students together, technology will play a significant role going forward. How do we do this? And I, I, would, I would be remiss if I just said, here's where we're at, how do we let you do this? So that students can, can use these activities. You find the project. You cannot start with the technology. You want to start with a project that's out there that will meet your curriculum needs, whether it be something in social justice, whether it be the environment, whether it be science for scientists, whether it be an exchange over literacy. Whatever your project needs are, you find the project that suits your curriculum needs and you wrap your technology and your applications around it. And trust me when I tell you that once you delve into a project, those other topics become readily apparent. Those needs are obvious and you know where you need to go. You don't need the, that full-on screen of all that technology. You'll need the sliver that suits the project. Today, I'd like to present to you one such project. And you heard from Marianne at the introduction that I've been involved in this project for, for 20 years. Now we're going into our 21st year this year. And so this project, I believe, has the answer you're looking for as a great beginning spot for you. This is our time, is the name of the project, Time Project. It has gone all the way back to 1995, and members of the European Union and teachers such as yourselves have been involved throughout. In fact, it began in the Netherlands 
as a Dutch Canadian initiative. It was spearheaded by UNESCO and it became their first flagship project online back in 1995. Now I want you to think about the technology we used in 1995 and I can tell you that the project itself while we've evolved it remains fundamentally the same. We're now partnered with taking it global for educators and world-class schools out of the United States. Our goal is to have a creative collaborative inquiry based environment that we address the curriculum through. Uh, our goal is to have students gain insight into other nations, sustainable development, character education, peace and human rights topics. So these are the topics that have that real world application that I spoke about earlier and through the technology that we have create the connectivity and the engagement that I mentioned earlier that's part of this inclusionary classroom. We bring the world to your classroom without ever having one field trip, not one permission form required. They simply come into your room in your learning environment. What's this project about? Well, each year we have a number of activities around the project. The project is centered on one day in time where all the different youth of the world are invited to unite together across the time zones and meet face to face, perform activities in real time, and recognize that while they're working in their classrooms, students around the world are doing the same. There's a sense of unity that comes with the concept of working through time in the same time together. But there's, this is the list of the activities that are available. Before you get all excited or worried, you're never asked to do all of these. We create a wide variety of activities within our booklet and we ask you to choose your own adventure. Choose the entry point that you feel most comfortable doing. One year you might start out doing just one activity just to get your feet wet. Then when you realize the power of this kind of program and the engagement of your students through the technology, you, you realize I can do more. My students are asking to do more. Uh, our own host Mariana originally started out with one activity and now from what I'm hearing from her she's going to do a host of them. Let me explain a few of the most popular ones to you so that you have an understanding of what we're doing here. The first activity that's very popular is called Unite the Nations. It's an interactive game about and between countries and, it's, and the neat thing about this is that it's created by youth for youth. The students generate multiple choice questions about their own country around topics and you can see the topics listed there geography, history, social issues, arts, sports and the, the questions that the students generate are that which they hold most dear. Those things they want to share. Those things they want other students in other countries to research about themselves and to learn. Maybe it's the, it's the name of the flower that grows on the one side of the mountain in their country. Maybe it's the gold medalist from the most recent Olympics that, that everyone in their country was excited about and they want others to research and learn about. So the students design the questions. In fact, you cannot participate unless you help contribute to the test. Then, in a 24-hour period, it's a race against time to research all the questions and come up with the most correct number of answers that you can. So there's a collaboration to this in terms of the creation of the test. There's a collaboration that exists when you run the test in your own school. And there's a bit of a friendly co uh, competition that happens between schools to see who can get the most correct number of answers. The goal isn't to stump one another. The goal is to get each other to think deeply about each other's country and to celebrate mutually the successes of those countries as viewed through the students, not the teachers. So imagine now that inclusion-based classroom where students with a variety of, of, of abilities are put to this test. Trust me when I tell you, having done this for 20 years, all students can access this test. The technology allows them to get to it, the questions are manageable, and the students working in pairs or in small collaborative groups of three and four can together find the answers. And technically speaking, the answer is directly in front of them. It's about verifying which of the multiple choice responses is the most correct. So Unite the Nations has been and continues to be one of the most popular activities. It gets lots of students engaged. It allows the teacher to teach research methodology. If you have a librarian or a teacher librarian in your location, 
That person can be used to teach about collection management, resource usage, online sources, the list goes on and on. And it's all done through this lens of international cooperation. That's just one activity. Let's show a quick little video of students engaged in this activity. Mariana? Are we missing the video? Can we try Can sharing, we try sharing? Again. again? Again, again. I'm going to try that again, if you bear with me, folks. Here, share my screen. Let me know if this works. The project we're working on is the time date for the United Nations, and there's like a lot of countries, and they send us questions, and we have to answer them, and we make questions, and we send them to them. Uh, and what do you like about the project? Um, well, I like that it's about people, like what people are saying all over the world, and you get to know what other people's opinions are, but you also learn. And you get to know about different things that are going around the world that you might not have heard of. And you become friends and you interact with people that you never met before. And it's really cool just to meet people and see what they think about things that you're trying to do. It's really cool. Take it, bring it back. Take it, bring it back. That's not creepy. Barcy, did you get a question? Um, we are given questions and we go on the internet to find the answer. So let's say there'll be a question, what's the Turkish word for the mourning of the dead? 
and we look it up and there are multiple choice answers. And so um, we're just like working as a class to find the answer to these questions. Um, I want to do a video conference because, I don't know, it just seems cool to meet other people around the world. Um, it would be much easier to communicate with other kids around the world and share ideas and answers and just talk with other people. You don't really know. Okay, if we can go back. Can we come back, uh, Mariana? There. Thank you. So, Unite the Nations, there are some challenges that you might face when you put it together, but when you listen to the video, what did you hear? Students comments. They decide what they're looking for. They decide what questions are going to even pose. They collaborate with their friends to find the answers. In an inclusive education model, you know that this will work. You know that your kids will have access and can participate fully. And think of what you're going to be doing behind the scenes for the teaching to make that work. So you're doing a fine job already and all you're doing right now is simply implementing another group's project into your classroom. You're bringing it inward. They will see themselves in it. And what did the students say? They said they've done the Unite the Nations in one year and now they can't wait to do more. Well, what else is there that can be done and how easy can you incorporate it into your school? video conferencing. Right now, we're doing the very thing. We're using Adobe Connect, much as my school does when it's time project day. And you can see the power of this particular platform for the project to bring other schools in into yours around very engaging topics. This particular year, we have three new topics. We have three new topics each year. This year, the topics include gender discrimination, policing and the use of lethal force by police forces, and the crisis in democratic processes. Now, while these topics sound rather lofty, in each case they center around a social justice human rights issue that is current and that can be easily found in, in, in research. The other thing that you have to understand is in the video conferencing element, we support you in each and every step. We provide you with the sample lessons, the questions you will use, some background content information and that gets you rolling on the research side of things. In terms of the video conferencing side of things, we provide you with a whole series of supports to find partners around the same topic at different times in different time zones to connect. This is what your classic conference studio looks like. It might look different in each school. Literally, I've had students clustered around uh, a laptop with one camera and aiming the camera at that group of students. It can be as, or it can be as elaborate as this, this conferencing studio with students around in several microphones. It can, it can be met wherever you're at. There are three different video conferencing formats. So again, you get to choose the level that you, you're most comfortable with. There's the face-to-face -face show and share model of video conferencing. There's a simulation of a House of Commons debate. And there's a third one, which I'll show you as well. This is a video that I'll share with you that gives you just a little visual insight as to those first two formats. Mariana, can we share the screen again? Wait here. And share, and enter. So note the ground rules. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Hi. 
Hi, can you hear me? So here's that format we talked about face to face. Hello. Hello. My name is Sean. Uh, this is Betsy. This is Betsy. This is Pat. This is Pat. And Aunt David. We go to a school called Prince Andrew. It is located just north of Sydney, Ontario, Canada. We're all 13 years of age. Good morning. We mean good morning. Do you want to introduce yourself or you want us to? Uh, we can introduce ourselves. My name is Emma. And my name is Randy. I'm Helena. Uh, my name is Julia, and I'm uh, Helena. I'm Sammy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but why do you have a moose in the front? A moose is one of the symbols of Canada. Oh no! No, it's That's the beaver. Yeah. Your That's symbol is the beaver. <laughs> no, the the, the leaf. The leaf. Yeah, but we have moose. We have moose safaris, and it's we... our it's our uh, animal. <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, what would you like a guy if necessary for your own country? Okay, we have all red and two green. Okay, if we can go back to the video, or to, sorry, to the slideshow. Are we back? I don't see the screen. Mariana, can you switch us back? Well, hopefully you can still hear me, and I'll continue talking while we wait for the, the switch to go back. In both... I have... I switched... Okay, I don't have it on my screen. No. Do you see it now? I'm going to... No, you can't, because I can see. What about you? What about the pretense? Okay. Because I'm moving I'm the slides now. I'm going to come back in, because it's not... I don't, I don't see myself here. Sorry. Okay. Okay, we are going to wait. Uh, well... Joe has been talking about 
internet problems, uh, audio, tech problems, but <laughs> everything that uh, he has uh, been sharing actually can happen. And many of you have been commenting uh, in the text that these things can happen. And I suppose many of you have had experience of uh, just to give him the, the right. Okay. So you just let me know if you had any problems of these kind of problems. I made uh, like technology around audio. Okay. Welcome, Joe. And I was trying to entertain the people. Can you see the slide now? I can indeed. Here I am. Yes. Sorry, folks, about okay. that. Uh, this was made on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> So when you consider the opportunities here to connect, and you have to remember that with this kind of project, and that's why I'm here with you today, you have support at every level. So we will support you in the resources you need to attack the questions we will, and, and, and understand the topics that your children will debate. We even give you a step-by-step -step guide as to how to set up a video conference just like the kind you saw there, whether it be a face-to-face -face show and share or whether it be a House of Commons simulation with the red cards and the green cards. We even have the 10 questions you will use to conduct that House of Commons debate. We have a whole e-learning environment that you'll have access to where we have rubrics and checklists. We even have teacher uh, um, frameworks. So step by step how to set up one of these projects in your school. We also have ambassadors all around the world who will answer your emails. I understand that one of our ambassadors is in the audience as we speak. Susanna is here with us today. She is one of our Eastern European uh, ambassadors and one of her roles is to support you with email answers to your questions. So at each level if you say to yourself it looks good, I think I could do it but I would need a lot of help. Let me tell you that today you have a lot of help and you have a lot of support through our project. All you have to do is indicate an interest in signing up. And once you do, and once you choose which activities out of that long list you wish to engage in, all the support comes your way. So for example, if you chose the Model UN, which is the most challenging but also as equally rewarding ways to video conference, we have a coordinator whose sole job is to talk to people and help them understand and deal with the Model UN issues. And we have about a dozen, a dozen resources, both video resources and paper resources, to support you in your preparations. When you look behind the scenes of any video conference, including the one that we're engaged in right now, some of the standard rules apply. Speak slowly, avoid local slang, take turns one at a time, be aware of the echo, you heard that in many of the videos, and of course, as I say to the students, use your best manners. Once you chose the, the format you engage in, again, as I said a moment ago, all the resources come your way to support you in this. And remember that the goal here is to allow an inclusive-based classroom, to allow multiple students with a variety of learning styles a way to access your curriculum, a way to feel included and part of the larger piece, despite the fact that you have a variety of learners, a variety of abilities, a variety of challenges and only one you. This, this type of inquiry-based learning using technology allows you to access all of those. One of the other things that you need to be aware of behind the scenes, something that you might be familiar with because you're an e-tweening teacher, is that testing thing. You have to be aware that your conference will happen at the, the rate of the lowest participant in terms of speed. So if they have a lower, slower uh, local IP address, local server, it will slow down the conference. There are ways around that with certain technologies and we try our best through Time Project to provide you some of the access to technology to make it as fast as possible. One of the other things you need, of course, is a, a reliable partner. So for example, my partner here, Mariana, and I tested the equipment yesterday. We wanted to make sure our connection was going to work, even the back and forth thing that we were working on with showing you as many videos as we could. We tested all that prior to the actual event. If time project happens on one day in time, you want that to be as positive as possible. So you test ahead. 
be aware of your technology and the technology of your partner. That will help you troubleshoot any issues you have. Like any other online project, it's all about the reliability and the communication between you and your partners. The best thing about Time Project is that we have facilitators to assist you with that. You're not alone. One of our other activities, and sometimes it is the intermediate piece, the step between research competition, which a lot of people can engage in and feel good about, and video conferencing, which somehow and sometimes feels daunting. That intermediate piece is blogging, and we have that as well. For each of the three topics this year and each year in Time Project, we set up a dedicated blogging site that's behind a firewall, that's safe for you to use, and it's based upon each of the topics. So if a group of students are engaged in gender discrimination, they would go to that site to do their blogging. If they're engaged in policing and the use of lethal force, conversely, they go to that site. And all the students worldwide begin their blogs prior to the day and then on the day, and the conversations are ongoing. It's a great way to post pictures, write biographies about Time Project, and to, and to explore the topic from their perspective that they've researched at the level they can research it in the manner that that's accessible to them. This is the very definition of inclusion-based education through inquiry and through technology. I'll show you a brief video, Mary, uh, Mariana, yep, on this very thing. on them for human reasons like putting cancer into them and using uh, different types of medications that scientists have recently come up with and seeing if what the changes on the animal is. And what aspects of the time project do you like? I like that we can communicate with a, a bunch of other people around the world and we all get to say our opinions on the animal experimentation and how there's pros and cons to it, and we just get to talk back to them, and then they can tell us what they like, and that can change our opinion of it, and we can tell them what we like, maybe it'll change their opinion of it. Yeah. Okay, we're back. So you can see from the blogging, you can you so you can see from the blogging, those were grade six students, ten and eleven years old. And you could hear that that what they were excited about was the idea of exchanging, exchanging the thoughts with other students, trying to persuade each other, trying to show their feelings and their thoughts on a very important, very current topic that they've researched, so they have ownership over this material, and that they've supported their ideas with evidence but they're still open to the dialogue that is being created. Yes, those students were very confident. They were grade six students, confident in the information they understood, they shared, and then received all sorts of input from a variety of ages, high school students, students their same age, and it all worked safely in our blogging sites through Time Project. So if you think about preparing your students, you can have them ready for this kind of activity because again, we send you all the materials on blogging, we send you the topics so that you can engage the students in the conversation, we send you the questions, the open-ended 
inquiry-based questions that you can ask. Students then can work on the information through a variety of the technology that you're providing and that you've allowed into your classroom through their own devices or the devices that you have available. And as they gather their materials, you are teaching them the format of blogging, the writing format, something that you can mark and assess, something that you can track, and then throughout the dialogue, all that information is saved so you as a teacher can go back and look at what they're saying throughout. Yeah, these students were 11 years old. So if you think about what's behind this in terms of the project as a whole, you have a huge number of oral communication expectations you're covering. Geography and history expectations are covered. Net standards are being covered as well as well as writing formats, language use, and for students who are acquiring English as a second language, their ability to communicate in a second language is all being tested throughout. So you have lots of justification to your superiors, whether it be a headmaster or a school principal or a superintendent of education as to the validity of this project and things you can do with it. Not to mention the inquiry-based learning that happens, which is currently all the rage in education. In all cases, there's a, a, a background to this where you prepare the students in advance, where there's some time prior to the time day. Time day is November the 25th. You have over almost two full months of time, eight, six to eight weeks to prepare your students in whichever sliver of this project you care to engage in. I'm going to skip past these pieces here. What do you need? Up front, simple, a laptop or a microphone and a camera. You need some kind of video conferencing platform. It could be Skype. We prefer Adobe Connect or Zoom or BlueJeans or maybe Google Hangouts because they're a little more secure. You need an external IP address. Don't kid yourself. You have to double check because it might be behind a firewall. You need it all day for your internet access. Even if it's just research, you need to book the library to research in the, in the school library, the school lab to research all day. And optional, a data projector and a large screen. What happens next for next time when the camera's turned off? Well, you've made connections. You've brought in real world experiences to your students. You've allowed them to access the curriculum at their level using tech, interactive technologies that will excite them and engage them using and discussing questions about the real world that will excite and engage them and they will feel valued members of your class because they're engaged with the rest of the class in a whole group activity. I guess at this point it's your oops, it's your oops, your opportunity to ask if you have any questions. It's your time to ask questions. Uh, well, I have uh, seen several questions during the talk in the chat. One of those have been which tools are you using or have been using, which you have already mentioned. But maybe maybe some other questions, uh, if you would like to ask Joe now, uh, or maybe you have some other comments you would like to add. If you would like to say a few words, no problem, I can even give you the mic. Uh, I'm going to add maybe here the files that uh, Joe has shared with me already. The files are uh, for you to download where you can read more. What I hope you can see the files to activity booklet and time project now if you wish to download and read carefully. And maybe you would like to participate in this year's uh, time project. You can also access the the documents on our e-training event on so they are easily available okay Joe back to you I'm wondering if you can add the call for participation letter that introductory letter that I sent out as well that's very helpful for teachers to use with their administrators to let them know what it is they're trying to do okay I will uh, if I can't use share it now I will add it later to the event 
uh, where they can all, always uh, access uh, like as the history of the event and that's what I'm going to post it in our uh, eTwinning inclusive education group and all of the materials and all of the screenshots and recording will be there so people can come back like it. Thank you for mentioning that. My friends, the, the goal here is to help you with the, the enormous task that you have each and every day, which is educate the young people of your country for the future that's yet to come. It's for them to discover their future selves, and they do it through the inclusionary classroom that you help create. What I've tried to do today is, is to lay down a foundation for you, an argument, if you will, of why you need to have interactive technologies, why at the end of the day you teach those technologies and their use to your students as explicitly as you teach math and history and geography. And then you create activities where they can pick and choose the technology appropriate so they can engage into the curriculum, show you what they're able to do and what they know at their level, at their pace. And, and then I tried to show you how a project like Time Project allows you to do that rather seamlessly. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's a daunting task. Trying to create a lesson for a large group of people without differentiation can be challenging. When you have a differentiated project that is inquiry-based, proven over time, filled with resources that support you, the teacher, and your students, the learners, the argument is, why wouldn't you try? Why wouldn't you engage? We're here waiting for you. It's just a matter of time. And we'd love to see you this time, November 25th, 2016. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we have a few questions and before you log out. Uh, and I think there are quite interesting questions from Alexandra first, where she says, uh, she asks whether, uh, what would be the optimum, uh, optimal number of teams in that conference? What do you think? What would you suggest? The optimum number of activities? I suppose uh, the web conferences. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure uh, about the question, but for instance, I could try to answer it because I have like uh, experience as a participant last year for the first time. So I scheduled as many uh, web conferences as my students wished. So the point is, uh, every half an hour you can schedule a conference with somebody, and that is so perfectly prepared. And uh, Joe is great in organizing that, and we teachers have, uh, in a way, exchanged emails. And I would check, okay, so my time zone, time zone is Central European time, so the students from Indonesia, it will be, I have to count, of course, I have to be good at counting. But we had like 12 conferences last year in less than six hours. And it was perfect. It had so much fun. And I must tell you that the students varied from 12 years old, 11, and my, and even students from the university. And uh, that's the whole point. When you see the students from Canada talking about, eagerly about the problems of uh, blogging and uh, social networks, and my high school students, who are like 17 or 18, they were appalled by their critical thinking. But it was then exchange and the learning of languages, and what also uh, many of you have written. Uh, it was it was perfect. They prepared share and tell, but they also had discussions. They asked questions. What do you think? What do you think? So it was like in the 30 minutes. If you wish to have it longer, you can do with the same thing. But it, it, the point is to give, I would say, like different opinions, right, from different countries. Uh, it's it's your choice. It's really your choice. And you can do like time projects only for two hours. My students and I did it for 12 hours last year. And this year, Joe, you will not believe it, but they want to sleep in school. And I told them, no, not a chance. <laughs> because as, uh, as maybe some of you asked me, why did we come to school at 1 a.m.? Because the project usually starts in our time zone at 1 a.m., which is actually the best thing for them, because that's the first time that they can come to school in such an early hour and uh, it was like, wow, yes, we're finally school at 1 a.m. Uh, and they brought like uh, sleeping bags and snacks and we made coffee and we really had the perfect time. Uh, it was early in the morning, but students from Indonesia, it was 10 a.m. for them. Students in Canada, they were in school in the afternoon. So it was really something special. I, I can't explain, but I hope from my enthusiasm, you will get the idea. 
And Any same, other questions? <laughs> right, you can have one conference. You can have two conferences. You can take on just the research project. It's really up to you. And as minimum or maximum as you wish to try, you will have support at every step and partners around the world who are eager to, to team up with you. If you think of the list of people who are here today, the, the 30 plus people who have been in this session, where are they from? They are from all over the world right now. If each of those classrooms were to connect online, think of the power for your students. Any other questions? Mariana, so, thank you for that video yeah. link. I'm yeah. ready to see it myself. Uh, well, um, last year we, when we finished, uh, we created a short two-minute video just for everybody now to see how it was for us. Because I also had, you know, I didn't know what I can expect. Uh, but I, I can only tell you this, that uh, Joe is really, really well prepared and he's so organized. And uh, the colleagues, everybody who participates, it's so, uh, it's so nice. It doesn't matter if you even didn't have some topic prepared and if there are some internet connections. The students love seeing uh, each other. Where are you from? My students really had fun. They were trying to speak in, in uh, uh, Spanish, sorry. Uh, then, uh, they were, but we, we, the call communication was in English, but the students from Colombia came and they, when they see each other, okay, there's a nice looking boy there, or there's a nice looking girl, and then they try to co communicate, no matter whether they understand the language or not. So I think it's sharing and bonding and getting the cultures and, but we had some serious discussions as well, so uh, it was it was really, really, really interesting. That's why I invited Joe to tell you more about this. Thank you, my friend. And thank you to everyone for being such an amazing audience. Uh, I've reminded you that we are on Facebook, Time Project, uh, and we are also at www.timeproject.org, and all our links are right there on our main website. You can learn more about us and what we do. You can see all the different connections, uh, web links that are there. See, we've been around for, for 21 years, and with your help, we'll be around for another 21 years. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe, for coming, and thank you for this wonderful surprise as a photo from the last year's conference in uh, Dubrovnik when we met. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's our selfie. Uh, these are some of the teams, actually, people who have been the members of Time for some sometime, yeah. And um, if you wish to get the certificate of participation, please fill in the Google uh, form that I have just posted. And uh, I hope you are going to think about it. And as Joe mentioned, at least start one activity, whichever you like. If you like vlogging and a student like to vlog, why not? And I think in time, we can start something on e-tweening. Our, our group can start something on e-tweening. Actually, as Joe mentioned, we can have a time project for like uh, the, the, the participants uh, and the members of our group if they are willing to, uh, to participate in 24 hours because we can dedicate like 10 hours or 12 hours and uh, I know that sometimes it's a longer period intervening uh, projects are very uh, exhausting for, for some of us but then again a 12 hour or 24 hour it can, it can work fine, and I know many of the colleagues have been doing it also on e training but uh, this could be really fun, and I would like to thank Joe one more time for giving us a lot of ideas, a lot of tips, and uh, I think this will come in handy for any of the e training projects we are doing, because we are involving uh, video conferences as well. Okay, so thank what you. can we say, but... Thank you one more time, Joe, and to everybody here in the group who come and uh, who have been listening to your lovely presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening, and we hope to see you soon in time. Okay. Bye, everybody, and I'll see you tomorrow for another expert talk with a colleague from uh, Israel, and uh, it's... It was, it was fun and I hope uh, I'll see you on the time project and also in our group.